Today we're going to be talking about ubiquitous computing. Um, people, a lot of people also call it Ubicomp, so I'm going to be using the phrase Ubicomp as well as ubiquitous computing. So whenever you hear me say Ubicomp, that's just a compression of, of uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitous computing. Because as you can tell, it's quite hard to say ubiquitous a lot. So that's why people say Ubicomp. Okay, so Ubicomp. So is this the idea of computers being everywhere, or is it is it more than that? There's a kind of vision associated with uh, with Ubicomp, which is all about, um, I guess, sort of disappearing of computers, or at least um, the idea of computers um, um, not being kind of visible to us. Not necessarily that we can't see them, but they're effectively invisible in our kind of practices. So when we kind of go and do stuff in the world. We're interact interacting with and using computing technologies all the time, but the ways in which we're doing it, we're not really focusing on on the te on the technology itself. And it's quite in contrast to kind of how people talk about people say using mobile phones and just being completely focused on the phone and so on. So the idea of and the vision of Ubicomp is of this of this kind of uh, world of um, um, seamless interactions with technology that just simply uh, help us get stuff done. One of the founders of Ubiquitous Computing, um, or Ubicomp as I'll now call it, was Mark Weiser, and he talked particularly about calm computing. So this idea that there's not this kind of frenetic activity interacting with all these devices and managing all this kind of digital stuff. Rather, I'm just simply able to do things in life in a kind of calm way, and it just so happens that I use technology to get those things done. Way back in the midst of time, in the early days of Computerfile, we did something called a video called What is a Computer, I think it was, with um, Professor Tom Rodden. And we were talking about the ideas of computers being in credit cards and computers being in all sorts of places that you don't even realise. Things like the Internet of Things, I suppose, we're talking about here. But it's not just, as you say, that. It's also the fact that our interaction with them is not something that we even necessarily consider. Is that is that about right? What the kind of the idea of Ubicomp turns on is that um, it's embedded into everyday life. So in much the same way that uh, we don't really think necessarily about some of the infrastructures in our house that, we, that kind of enable our house to go to work properly. So I mean, an example would be something like the heating perhaps. A lot of the time you don't think about the heating, but as soon as it breaks down, it suddenly becomes uh, manifest and kind of very much visible, even though most of the time you're not really, you know, it just kind of, it just sort of works most of the time. One of the ways to understand you become where it comes from is to understand that Mark Weiser was um, kind of reacting against what was very popular at the time. So he developed Ubicomp in the late 80s and early 90s. Virtual reality was a big deal at the time. It was a kind of first wave of VR. VR is doing this thing where we're taking people into the machine in a kind of very absorbing way. And if you've been around anyone using a VR headset, you'll know that it's very difficult to communicate with them and to have any kind of shared experience. And so Ubicomp was about taking the computing and, and putting it into the world, embedding it into everything um, uh, to avoid that problem of being absorbed into the machine. So it was very much kind of uh, of the view that technology should let us get the things done that we need to and not get in the way. And so VR is very much the opposite of that, where the technology becomes the focus of attention. So it's, it must be seen in the context, that historical context, the reaction against um, against VR, really. Was Mark Weiser at somewhere like MIT or, or one of these places, Berkeley or something? So Mark Weiser was uh, kind of one of the, it's best known basically as someone who was at Xerox Park. Now, Park is Palo Alto Research Center. So Xerox Park was uh, a division of Xerox, who the photocopier company, who are still around. Park was very famous for um, establishing some of the core uh, components, I guess, sort of elements of computing, which we're all very familiar with now. Park developed what looked like one of the first PCs, effectively, called the Xerox Alto. You'll see it kind of looks like a desktop computer. It's got a keyboard, it's got a mouse. It's a, a kind of well-known story that Steve Jobs went to Park and had a look around and saw the Alto and interface and took a bunch of things from it and implemented it into um, Apple's uh, range of machines and kind of famous for doing so. But, you know, he saw something that, that seemed like it kind of worked really well and, and as any sensible person should do, uh, take that and use it in some kind of way. So the history of um, Xerox Park is really important because of 
because of that aspect. I mean, there's other aspects of the Alto which are important, like networking and so on. Crucially, during the kind of late 80s and early 90s, so sort of bringing us up to Mark Wise's time, um, Xerox Park was developing um, a load of different sorts of technologies um, around things like um, improvements in sort of mo uh, networking, mobility, so sort of uh, reducing sizes of things, making devices more mobile, um, uh, improving kind of their networking capabilities, um, uh, dealing with issues around power, those sorts of things. They were developing all these different technologies and uh, one of the issues was that Mark Weiser saw was that there was no coherent vision of all these different technologies and how they might fit together. And he had this, um, this way of thinking which brought them together and that's what birthed this idea of Ubicomp. Mark Weiser's vision um, was to take, um, or the Ubicomp vision was to take all these different disparate bits of technology that were being developed like, you know, Wi-Fi networking and um, better power management and more powerful computing and display technologies and all these sorts of things and bring them together into this vision of ubiquitous computing, which was about you know computing being everywhere, um, with you, on you at all times, uh, in the woodwork, so to speak, as he put it, um, embedded into buildings, embedded into you know all sorts of places, vehicles, those sorts of things. In a way, it's kind of partly like the world, well, elements of it are kind of a bit like the world we're living in now, in the sense of, you know, cars have extremely sophisticated um, management systems. Um, some cars are connected to the internet at all times. Um, we have uh, Internet of Things technologies in our homes, so smart bulbs, smart heating systems, whatever it might be. We also have devices we carry around um, with us, you know, all, in all places. So there's many ways in which the uh, vision that he created of Ubicomp actually is kind of with us today, today certain elements of it. So it's Although at the time it was massive, you know, it's worth emphasising how how ambitious it was as a vision at the time. Given that you know, talking about the late eighties, um, there's no sense in which everyone had a desktop PC at that at that point necessarily at all. So it's a very very different world. I think that's if anyone's you know, people who are watching this have to really understand if they if they weren't around then they have to understand how much of a different world it was and um, and how much of a kind of visionary person he needs to be to bring the stuff together. There's another aspect that's important about bringing all those technologies together, and that was a kind of uh, to do with the relationship between Park itself and Xerox. Now, as with any, and there's a story about the demise of the corporate um, uh, research lab, which we can probably talk about in another video, but um, as with any kind of corporate research lab or any kind of facility like this, he needs to justify his, his existence to, um, to Xerox. And one way to justify the development of these very interesting technologies was to say, well, actually part of a bigger vision and the vision was Ubicomp. And so that, so not just, it wasn't just that it had a, a purely had a function in terms of the kind of computer science elements, but also this kind of um, element of, of how do you justify this work it actually occurring at all? So I think, you know, he's a really important figure because he brings together all these things. And then obviously that leads to this idea of Internet of Things, which is nowhere near as sophisticated in its vision as Mark Wise's original work. There's no way it would really exist without the idea of Ubicomp. If you want to read a core text about Ubicomp, you can read his really famous 1991 Scientific American article called The Computer for the 21st Century. It's not a hugely technical bit of writing, so I'd encourage everyone to go and have a look at it. It kind of lays out this vision, the Ubicomp vision, very clearly about this world um, are in which we live in this kind of Ubicomp world, all these different sort of sense technologies, different bits of computing embedded into everything. Um, also, it, you know, goes through all the different challenges that are associated with this, because we could talk at length about the, some of the issues that it brings up. So if we're doing ubiquitous computing, we suddenly have issues around things like, as I mentioned already, uh, power becomes a real problem. How do you power all these devices? Um, sensors, how do you collect sensor data and in, make sense of it at all? Because there's all this stuff flying around in terms of the data you're collecting. How do you network stuff? How do you ensure c a continuous provision of networking services? These are all major problems still now, obviously. How do you get the adequate data science stuff to do the inference to make sure you understand the data you're getting back and then act on it? How do you determine things like context? These are really critical problems. And what are the kind of interaction techniques that you need to build 
to enable t people to actually interact with these um, always on, always with you type devices or devices that are embedded into non-standard things like, you know, you're not expecting the wall to have a computer embedded into it. What's the form of interaction that you might uh, need to enable someone to interact with a wall in an appropriate way? That's not a trivial thing to work out. I mean, it took a long time just to get to, you know, this sort of thing, right? Um, many, many different prototypes were, were made to get to the mouse. It's a surprising amount of work in something that we now take for granted. Did Mark Weiser see his vision fulfilled? What, what happened? Mark Weiser, unfortunately, died in 1999. So <clears throat> he died quite young. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so he, he would have seen the, some of the fruits of what he had created in terms of vision. Um, I guess in terms of things like miniaturization and increased networking, you know, improvements in networking technology and all those sorts of things. But but I really think, um, you know, he would be missing out on the Internet of Things that we see now. And, and there's a very direct line between that, as I said, between that and Ubicom. So I think there was a lot more to come, basically, that, that he never saw, unfortunately. I, uh, I would argue here that the way that the Internet of Things has developed uh, in a kind of ramshackle way from various different manufacturers is far from his vision by from what I understand. How do you go about testing a system like this when you're coming up with it from nowhere and these aren't kind of devices you can ship off to somebody to have a play with? How do you go about making sure it does stuff that you wanted to do. When they were building these different devices, they talked about building technologies at different scales. They had a very small scale, post-it note scale, through to a kind of iPad size scale, through to a kind of whiteboard size scale. And they kind of experimented with different technologies that been involved in building those things and making them work. Um, in order to test them, um, they actually used them themselves in their own work. They sort of uh, ate their own dog food, so to speak. In working with them, they understood more about what it meant to live in this way with those technologies. So that way in which they tested stuff themselves was very, very important for um, the kind of Ubicomp vision and establishing the, the Ubicomp vision for, for others. Um, and, you know, making it um, seem like it's taken seriously, which is we're so serious about this technology, we're just going to use it ourselves. And I think at the time that wasn't necessarily really one of those kind of practices that people would generally engage in, they would generally be um, uh, perhaps engaging users, other people in, in trials for a specific short amount of time um, and measuring various facets of, of, those, of those trials, those experiments. Drawing very badly here and so on. So you'd have two sets of pulses, one delayed from the other. It's what we call quadrature encoding. We can actually derive from that. Yeah, and this was which... back in 1994 something or other this was um, uh, and the, there's this big crunch coming up that we're going to run out of IP addresses. Any